when we think of uh, Africa, I would say that um, religious crisis, well, unemployment, and clearly all the attendant woes of bad governance fueled by political conflicts will continue to sustain the upsurge of non-state armed groups and other criminal networks in most countries. Of course, some people may state some of these things I've mentioned as uh, contemporary challenges. I know some people refer to it as that. Next slide is speaking on the objectives and it's already been stated what I'm actually going to focus on. Next slide, please. The next slide would be clearly dealing with the role of women and girls in non-state armed groups and criminal networks. I will use examples um, from Nigeria uh, specifically to illustrate some of these um, roles. First role would be forced marriages. In the northeastern part of Nigeria, the three states of Borno, Adamawa, and Yobe states, they're known as the Bay states, you would find that because of the Boko Haram insurgency, this has lasted for decades, more than a decade. Um, women and girls have been forced into marriages to the insurgents. Several reasons why. Um, a good number of the girls are underaged, and sometimes, very sadly, they're actually handed over to the insurgents by their families in exchange for protection when the communities have been taken over by the um, armed groups. Um, you would also find that a good number of the girls and women are also kidnapped by the insurgents and forced into marriage. Um, the Chibok girls, I think it's quite global, um, are a good example, where 276 high school students were kidnapped since 2014. And uh, till date, 98 are still missing. 178 have been released at different times. Of course, the tales of war that come from some of the girls that have um, returned, that have escaped and returned clearly tells about these horrible stories of the sexual violence they experience in these forced marriages. Sexual abuses in both the um, internally displaced camps and refugee camps, where women and girls come to as a result of attacks at their communities, I think that needs to also be mentioned because um, it, it, it's uh, there have been several cases, a lot of investigations going on, but women and girls, even in that allegedly secure space, still face um, these um, levels of sexual violence, especially. Uh, sadly, once again, it's important to note that sometimes on investigation, you would find that some of the mothers, some of the parents of the young girls Actually, we have found that actually some of these girls are sent out to local brothels within the, some of these states. Um, once again, they're trying to uh, make some money, they will tell you, because of the um, situations of uh, irregularity of distribution of foods and nutrients within the camps. Of course, that touches on the um, next slide that would talk about um, malnutrition. Some of these are some of the things that women um, face. There's a massive displacement of women in their communities. And uh, I think my picture is covering that, that talks about the malnutrition. Um, a key role, once again, that the attackers, that the, these women play as victims, it's, it's important, I, I hope I didn't miss that, because it's important that the role of women in these groups remains a higher percentage as victims, more than perpetrators. Women and girls, uh, some of the women and girls are also used by the insurgents to cover up and carry out attacks. You would find that 
sometimes insurgents have even been known to disguise and dress in female clothing to attack communities and marketplaces. Women, of course, are used to gather intelligence and also lure victims um, for these armed groups and criminal networks. Uh, Dr. Dorina uh, did touch on this, forced recruitment. Some of these kidnapped women and girls are forced by the insurgents. It's really, they're forced by the insurgents to be suicide bombers. In uh, Boko Haram cases, a lot of the female suicide bombers uh, were some of these kidnapped victims. But it is important to also note that some have been known to be enticed based on religious sentiments, especially in Islam, where they're convinced of higher religious blessings um, must be clearly in the beyond because um, these tasks are deemed fatal if they are successful. But it's good to point out that at present, though the foundational concept of Boko Haram may have had a lot to do with Islam, but today, where schools are attacked by these insurgents or bandits or known gunmen, whatever name you put to it, um, most of the kids that are forcefully abducted are Muslims and non-Muslims and uh, recruited or trained, Mada Maridov or trained as child soldiers. Of course, it's important to note that the victims are not just the girls. Young boys are also part of it. Next slide, please. Now we come to the issues of human trafficking. Human trafficking, you may consider some women as perpetrators, but of course, majorly women and young girls are also victims. Women are used to lure younger girls and also persuade families to release their daughters, believing they are going abroad to school or to work. Of course, they get their the passports are seized from them and uh, usually most of them are prostitutes. Today in Nigeria, especially, we have what we call, um, we, know, we call them baby factories. You would find that girls, young teenage girls, some are pregnant already, but a good number of them are brought into that facility and impregnated. The objective is that upon delivery of those babies, those babies are going to be sold off. Um, of course, some may say um, adoption, my gosh, but um, that's what is happening. And it's happening uh, mostly now in the Southern uh, parts of Nigeria. It's a concerning bit. Um, you would find that um, all sorts of people are involved. Some of the perpetrators, have been known to also be um, religious individuals um, that run in the name. Sometimes you may even find that that uh, facility may have the, this is an orphanage, but the business is about selling off those babies. Um, some would even say, oh, the boys, baby boys are sold at a higher price than the baby girls, uh, very sad, but on the part of human and child trafficking uh, in the criminal networks. We come to drug trafficking. Drug trafficking, once again, um, women are, you can consider perpetrators, but more victims, because sometimes when you are investigating the perpetrators, as you go down the line, you see uh, that man that has enticed, encouraged, uh, sometimes forced, uh, because some will tell tales of economic woes. And if they're younger, you would find that the families actually hand them over to the quote unquote drug barons to utilize as couriers. Armed robbery, kidnapping groups, Women are victims, but uh, they have been known to be um, perpetrators. Um, they have been known to facilitate 
not just the violent acts, but also easing escape. Of course, uh, to pardon me, gentlemen uh, present, of course, a group of women, nicely made up pretty ladies, usually you would find that security agents take it for granted. You know, the group of girls with loud music in the car, ah, officer, how are you? Hey, good morning, this, uh, that. You say, ah, these ladies, where are you coming from? Ah, party, oh, goodbye. That's it. But these are a group that have committed very violent acts. We have, it has been found. Um, of course, the roles of women in these armed groups and um, criminal networks, it's been, why is it being highlighted? High percentage of them as victims instead of perpetrators. But of course, when you think of the security of any community, if you have women in these situations, the question arises, within the security sector, what is happening? Where are the women that sometimes that specialized role of being able to deal with some of these victims and also the perpetrators who can understand them best? Women have to be very, very relevant within the security sector and takes us to the successes and challenges of gender mainstreaming. Next slide, please. In the African security sector, we've looked at the plight of women within the communities. Now let's look at within the security sector that's supposed to deal with these issues, where are the women? And we must look at gender mainstreaming. Of course, uh, we have spoken about um, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. A lot of African countries, a lot of African leaders have adopted the UNSCR 1325. There are also regional policies within the African Union. Naturally, the contents of these policies, excellent. Everybody has undersigned. Nigeria has a national gender policy. I'm sure all countries here, there must be their own national gender policies. Question is, how much implementation is in process? Policies have been launched. That's a challenge. Efforts to improve um, gender mainstreaming, of course, like I said, it's work in progress. We must note, I continue to emphasize, to better protect the citizens, especially these women and girls, we must have actionable gender policies. What are we trying to address? Low representation of women, especially in the decision-making levels within the security sector. Let me once again use Nigeria as an example. The Nigeria police force has a well-crafted gender policy that is more than a decade old, and but it's, it's now still under review. Um, other security institutions, the armed forces, everybody has a gender policy. But in practice, the representation of women in the security sector, especially at the decision-making level, is very low. Most management levels have just a handful of women, so only one or two. In the Nigeria police force today, I was, um, there's no woman at the management level. I was the last as the deputy inspector general of police. I retired in 2019. We're still waiting, you know, for that one woman to come up. In Boronu state, <clears throat> sexual gender violence is the number one prevalent crime. The woman in charge of the gender unit is a superintendent of police. She's not even part of the management team in Borno State Command. And then as you spread out to the local government areas, you would find that the number of female personnel, especially in the police, is very low or non-existent. 
this is the first port of call for some of these victims. And you wonder, how is this victim being received and handled? Of course, there have been um, recent efforts to improve gender mainstreaming all over Africa. I must note and commend all parliaments. Parliaments have um, taken steps in legislating, discarding laws that are centuries old, that have inhibited women in the security sector, discarding them, and women can now go beyond certain ranks and certain duties. Recruitment policies have also been provided for gender-balanced uh, opportunities. Armed forces in Nigeria, I think since 2011, they now not meet females in the Defense Academy. What does that mean for combat and training? That means that in Nigeria, the females can rise up to the rank of, you know, the highest rank. I think at this time, the first set that entered, I think they're at the uh, level of captains or majors. I think that's what they are at this time. Of course, in I, I think in Africa, the cultural, the religious inhibitions that have stigmatized women, keeping them or limiting them from en enlisting, they're also being addressed. I must commend African civil society organizations, international organizations that continue to support training programs, sensitization awareness campaigns within the security sectors, gender desk officers to address gender related issues in the security sector are also being established. Let me go to the concluding aspect, which is to answer the question we have young security sector leaders here present. What is being expected? Next slide, please. What recommendations can be made before you? Of course, I have also said that we need actionable gender mainstreaming policies. There must be, no, next slide, please. And the conclusion, next slide. Next slide. So I can run down the recommendations. There must be, we must implement the contents of the gender policies. We have them. Uh, there should be, I believe there should be a mandatory percentage of females from the recruitment stage. It's not just about everybody can come. Let it be whatever percentage you know, it's determined there must be a percentage of women. Uh, may the, the question may arise, will they come? Let the percentage be set first. I think it's important. The establishment of the gender desk to design frameworks for gender related issues within the security sector. It should go beyond the national level down to the state and especially the local government levels. Of course, we must encourage security sector leaders to work with traditional and religious leaders on the reorientation campaigns um, against these uh, inhibitions it must be supported by the leaders. Training manuals within the security sector should be reviewed to ensure that gender related issues form part of the training, not only for the newly recruited, but for serving personnel. Welfare schemes within the sector should address the needs for both the male and female officers. I would give an example, simple example. In office, uh, office and training facilities, sometimes you may find that those specific something as simple as the restrooms, the specific sanitation places for the female needs are not really, really there. In some offices and uh, training facilities. Also, when it comes to operational uh, gear for the PPEs, um, it's a one size fits all, but we may we have to remember that sometimes the chest frame, the smaller frames of the women, we may need to consider customized uh, PPEs to suit the women equally. Um, Female representation in the decision-making level in the security sector, I think may also need a mandatory requirement, quota requirement 
to ensure that more females are appointed to these levels. I think it's not about just seniority for promotion. It may be necessary to appoint women that, you know, officers that are efficient, effective, to come up to a certain level to be able to give that required support for gender related issues, especially as it concerns young women and girls. Um, female leaders in the security sector, the females right here in the security sector in service and retired have to lead the enlightenment campaigns and also mentor younger female officers. They need to know that nothing is keeping you any longer. If you can think it, you could get there, but you also have to do the work. And of course, as I conclude, international organizations as they work with security sectors in Africa must continue to demand for female representations in their programs and projects. I actually think that this seminar is one of those wonderful steps in um, encouraging uh, better steps in gender mainstreaming, because I think that as you are going back home, some of these uh, points will be taken back home to actually check, are we on the right track? Are we still on paper on this? Or are we walking the talk? Thank you so much.